No. But uh, our outside temp Now, Jonathan is preaching at Broadtop this morning. And he took Tristan with him because Tristan is going to be speaking up there next Sunday. And I checked the temperature this morning at Broadtop was not 18 degrees. It was 8 degrees. <laughs> so if Jonathan comes back looking stiff as a board, just understand. You may want to remember that, Logan, in prayer this morning. Pray for Jonathan and Tristan. But anyway, we hope they have a safe trip. Ephesians chapter 3, we'll begin there, uh, and we're going to actually begin at verse 1, just backtrack just a few verses, and then we'll, we'll uh, proceed from that point. Go ahead, uh, if you would, Logan, lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer, thanking you so much for blessing us with another day to gather and worship you. Lord, we pray that you will be with Bob this morning as he delivers his lessons, and we pray that what we hear we will spread to others. Lord, we also pray for Jonathan and Broadtop as he is speaking as well, and we pray those that hear his message will use it in their daily lives. Lord, thank you so much for everything you continue to do for us. Our blessings, they're so abundant, and we are so thankful. Lord, we pray that you will continue to guide us throughout this day and help us to make great decisions also throughout the week. Lord, we are so thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Okay, Ephesians chapter 3. Let's remember before we read these verses the purposes for Paul's writing the book. They can be summarized as follows. Uh, to express his deep love for the church there at Ephesus, to develop appreciation for the plan of salvation, to show the unity of all members of the church, to demonstrate that being, quote, in Christ means being saved according to the plan of God, and then also to provide practical instructions, causing the readers to live worthily of the gospel. So that, those are the purposes for writing the book. And then here is the outline of the book of Ephesians, again, to help you stay oriented. Remember, the first three chapters are here in Roman numeral one. The church is chosen, redeemed, and united in Christ. So we are finishing up that first major section of the book uh, here this morning in chapter three before he starts to get into some of these practical exhortations in the last half of the book. All right, I want to thank Dawn for teaching the class last week and sort of pulling together a number of these thoughts. Let's begin reading in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. He says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, in behalf of you Gentiles, if so be that ye have heard of the dispensation of that grace of God which was given me to you word, how that by revelation was made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in few words, whereby when ye read ye can perceive my understanding in the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known unto the sons of men, as it hath now been revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit, to wit, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of that grace of God which was given me according to the working of his power. Now, we're going to break there. We've gone back and looked at these verses and we pointed out that Paul is in, into a run-on sentence, and he starts that sentence in verse 1. He says, for this cause, I, Paul, but then he doesn't say what he did or does. He resumes this thought all the way down in verse 14. Look at that. Same wording. At verse 14, he comes back. That's one thing about Paul. He goes into a, a side channel, but he never forgets where he was 
He always comes back to pick it up, pick up the thought. And that's what he does in verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father. He's, in other words, going to express a beautiful prayer for them or on their behalf. Uh, but in the course of expressing that, he takes this siding here uh, for 13 verses and uh, develops these additional thoughts. So he says uh, that he is an apostle on behalf of you Gentiles. Again, remember that primarily he's writing to Gentiles in the church at Ephesus. If so be that ye have heard of the dispensation of that grace of God which was given me to you word. The dispensation of God's grace, the, the, the dispensing or the pouring out of God's grace toward Gentiles. All right. Brother Lipscomb, in his uh, commentary on these verses, uh, refers us over to Acts chapter 26. And I think it's important that we take a moment and look at this verse, if you would. Turn over there. Here in Acts 26, Paul is recounting his conversion. He's retelling it. And this is the third of three places in the book of Acts where his, his conversion is related. Chapter 9, of course, is where it occurs. Then chapter 22, he restates it. And then again, here in 26, he restates it. And he's telling about what happened on the road to Damascus when Jesus confronted him and what Jesus said to him. Look at um, verse 16, verse 15 beginning. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Now watch verse 16. But arise and stand upon thy feet for to this end have I appeared unto thee to appoint thee a minister and a witness, both of the things wherein thou hast seen me and of the things wherein I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I send thee, to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive remission of sins and an inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith in me. Now he's speaking to King Agrippa and he's telling the king what Jesus said to him on the road to Damascus. When that bright light appeared and Saul fell down and Jesus says, arise, stand on your feet. I have work for you. To, I'm going to send you on a mission. I have work for you to do for this cause to appoint thee a minister and a witness. Now, a witness is somebody who has what? Has seen something or observed something more precisely because it may be that they heard something with their ears. Maybe they smelled something. Maybe they saw it with their eyes, but somehow or another they observed it with their physical senses. And now they are telling about it under oath. That's the... the technical definition of a witness and the retelling of something that you've seen or observed. Well, had Paul seen Jesus before? Yes. Look at the next verse. Arise and stand upon thy feet for this end have I appeared unto thee to appoint thee a minister and a witness both of the things wherein thou hast seen me and of the things wherein I will appear unto thee. I think it's interesting, Brother Lipscomb points this out, that Saul of Tarsus had evidently seen, and by the way, he would be about the same age as Jesus Christ. He had evidently seen Jesus or seen the work of Jesus and the effects of Jesus' ministry, and he would see Jesus again. Here on the road to Damascus, Jesus is saying, you're going to be a witness of the things you've seen and that you will see in me. And primarily, you will be a witness to whom? Gentiles. To the Gentiles. This is where Paul was different from the other apostles, the earlier ones who went 
first to the Jews and then to the Greeks. Paul steps in at the then to the Greek stage, primarily to the Gentiles, although of course he would preach also to the Jews. Okay, comments on that or any questions? I thought that was a good insight and background here as Paul is writing as to what, uh, what his purpose is all about. Okay, yes, Jim. When he says that he's the prisoner of Jesus Christ on behalf of the Gentiles, this is exactly what he's referring to, what you, what the, what you uh, just brought us to in Acts 26. He's, uh, he's talking about the fact that if that had not happened, if Christ had not come to him and made him a witness to the Gentiles, he wouldn't be in prison. Right, right. And you're about two steps ahead of me, Jim. That's the next point I want to get to. Why was Paul imprisoned in Jerusalem with regard to Gentiles? How, how did Gentiles play into his uh, trouble? It's recorded in the book of Acts, in chapter 19 and, and other places. How, how, how did Gentiles play into his trouble? Yes. Wait just a second. Let me get, get a mic here to you so we can hear you. Go ahead. If I'd known that I was going to answer another question. <laughs> That's all right. Go ahead. Uh, The question is, how is Paul's imprisonment related to the Gentiles? What he I says, want, I am a pri uh, the prisoner of Christ Jesus in behalf of you Gentiles. What, what I wanted to comment about was looking at Paul's past, which he tells us about in other areas. He was a Jew. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was zealous in his persecution of the church. Had he continued that on that path, uh, he would have had nothing. To, he would have never been put in prison in Jerusalem. Okay. okay. He never would have. He would have continued on that path That's of persecuting right. the church, uh, which is what they were sending him to do. Right. Now okay. let's go. Let's turn back to Acts chapter twenty-one. Everybody, L look at this, if you would. This kind of puts into perspective, I think, what the, these comments are pertaining to. In Acts chapter 21, um, they set sail, they make a straight course unto Kos, the next day to Rhodes, Phoenicia, Cyprus, he talks about Tyre, tearing there seven days, and then finally to Jerusalem, okay? Um, down in verse 17, and when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. By the way, he has just ended his third missionary journey. Remember that? Acts chapter 21, verse 17 is the end of the third journey. And the day following, he goes into Paul and unto James and so on. He presents, you know, what about his work and what God has uh, been doing through him. But now drop down to verse 27. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, when they saw him in the temple, what did they do? They said he had desecrated the temple. He had done that by bringing who or what into the temple? A Gentile. And they even named it. it, it they, they may not even known his name, but they were referring, verse 29, they were referring to a man named Trophimus, and, and Luke tells us here they had seen Paul with Trophimus previously, and they just surmised or assumed that he had brought him into the temple. Trophimus, a Gentile. So they were all stirred up about this. And this leads to a huge, uh, almost a riot. Uh, well, it is a riot, shouting one thing and, and some shouting another, and finally the Roman authorities have to intervene, brings him into the castle, remember, and uh, because of the violence of the crowd, carried him away and, and questioned him. He's in prison, or he is, he is taken captive and, and apprehended by the Roman 
chief captain here, and in essence rescued when he was mobbed like that, because of the, these accusations that he was going to the Gentiles. And he was bringing Gentiles into the temple. All right? This was Paul's ministry to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. But the Jews vehemently objected to that. No, you can't do this. Gospel is not for the Gentiles. So when he says he is a prisoner of Christ Jesus in behalf of you Gentiles, he's saying it's because of the Gentiles that I'm working, I'm, I'm preaching to bring the gospel to you. And that's why I'm, I'm imprisoned. Now this imprisonment here is a later imprisonment. Ephesians, when he writes this book, he's actually in a Roman prison, but it's the same Genesis. Because remember, he appealed unto Caesar and is transported to Rome, and he is, he is imprisoned because of his mission to the Gentiles. So I think when he says, for this cause, he is relating back to not only his physical imprisonment, on behalf of the Gentiles, but the fact that he is, in essence, uh, an outcast by his own people, by the Jews, because he's, take, he's willing to take the gospel to the Gentiles like Jesus told him to. Yeah, okay? Gonna be a comment here. Don, just give me one second while we get a mic to you there. That, that is a critical thing to remember about Paul's ministry. He's, he is a minister to the Gentiles, and he never loses sight of his purpose and his, his mission. Yes, no. uh, Bob, I, I don't think the Jews really cared. Uh, I mean, they accused Paul of desecrating the temple, but I don't think they really cared whether he did or not. It was the accusation that was important, because if we go back to verse 21 in Acts, there it, it says that they believed Paul was teaching the abandonment of the law of Moses. Yes. And so they they accused him. They 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 were looking for something. Right. Paul's in town. He's going to be a problem for us. We got to get rid of him. Right. And this was a major problem in the first century church. You remember in Acts. Uh, 15 is it about the Jerusalem so-called Jerusalem conference and the meeting of the church there what are we going to do about this issue so it, it was it consumed their energy and their attention big time in the first century church yeah I think that's right that was the underlying issue we don't want to give up our preferred status our power our prestige as God's chosen people we don't want to turn that over to, to the Gentiles Good. Anybody else on that? Okay, Paula. Uh, I have a question. Go ahead. When we say the Jews, we do just mean certain Jews because many Jews came across right. to Christ. Good point. Yeah. Well, Paul himself was a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. So, yes, this isn't a blanket, uh, one-size-fits-all indictment. But Stephen did say, you do always resist the whole, so do you. And uh, he was stoned for that. Yeah. Good point. Anything else? Yes, Jim. Now, uh, go ahead. I just wanted to mention that uh, besides, besides the issue that he had uh, with uh, the, the zealous Jews, the ones who did not want the gospel preached. He then continued, or he had had, and would continue to have problems with Judaizers. Even, even those that became Christians wanted to bring over some of the old Jewish uh, requirements into Christianity. That's right. Which he was very adamant against. Yes. Because otherwise, this would have just been a sect of of the Jewish religion, much like the Pharisees or the Sadducees or whatever. In fact, that's what the Romans thought this Christianity was, a sect of Judaism. Yes, and, that, and good point. And we'll see that, I think, even more as we go on. 
this continuing effort by these Judaizing teachers to bind the old law. Remember when we were in Colossians 2, Paul spent a lot of time showing how that law had was like a middle wall of partition had been broken down to unite Jew and Gentile in Christ. Okay? So it, it would be a, an ongoing problem that he would deal with. Don. But I think we see, even in our time, that this problem hasn't gone away. The, the Catholics and the Protestants believe that the Jews are still God's chosen people. They still uh, probably financially support the existence of Israel. I'm not saying that Israel shouldn't exist, right. but what I am saying is that God specified, if you do what I tell you, then I will be your God and you will be my people. Right from the first day when Moses came down from the mountain, the people were already breaking the law. And God preserved them for the sake of bringing Christ into the world, but not for the sake of making them a special people forever. Yes, good, good thoughts. Yeah, I, I like how we can see the application of this today in our lives. This problem that Paul was dealing with hasn't gone away. It's a continuing issue. It just shows itself in different ways today. And we can learn a lot from understanding how Paul dealt with it. But he says that, that, that he is imprisoned on behalf of the Gentiles. If so be that ye have heard of the dispensation of that grace of God. It was given me to you. Now watch verse 3. How that by revelation was made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words. And then we talked about verse 4 a little bit. Whereby when ye read, ye can understand. You can perceive. This destroys the notion that the Bible is not understandable, which is a common myth. Even among religious people, there are those who teach and believe and have been led to believe that you can prove anything by the Bible. It's whatever you want it to mean. Your interpretation is as good as your interpretation. One interpretation is as good as another. Well, we would never believe that way in, other, in any other field. In mathematics, for example, we wouldn't say 2 plus 2 is 4 or 2 plus 2 is 6. doesn't matter, right, Ernie? I mean, we wouldn't say that. In mathematics, that's a field of knowledge and certainty and, of, and in logic and in persuasion and in any form of art. Uh, while there are personal differences, there is still such a thing as truth. You're driving down the, uh, the road, and the speed limit sign says 25 or 20 in a school zone, and there's a blinking light, and you're allowed, what, 11 miles over. <laughs> but you go 12 miles over and get a ticket. How persuasive is it going to be when you say to the officer, well, one law is as good as another. One position is as good as another. My interpretation was I could go 13 miles over. That's not going to get very far. Or in medicine, you get a prescription. And there's a dosage requirement on there. Okay, take this particular medication at this rate. Okay, nobody would say, well... One interpretation is good as another. Paul says, listen, when you read this, you can understand what I'm saying. You can perceive my understanding in this mystery. Now, what is a mystery? How would you define the word mystery as used in the Bible? Now, I'm not talking about as used on the, the bestseller list of popular novels in the New York Times bestseller list. Mystery. What is it? What is it? A something that is revealed. Something that is, a, a mystery is something that is still unrevealed. That's the sense in which Paul is using the word here. 
okay? The mystery of God's salvation process was not revealed until God chose to reveal it. It was a mystery. It was unknown how this was going to play out. There were prophecies. There were glimpses. Uh, there, there were uh, insights here a little, there a little. But the total plan of God's salvation was not revealed until God felt that the time was right to do that. And in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a virgin. And this salvation was revealed in Christ. That's what Paul is saying. And when you read my epistles, he says, you can perceive my understanding of that, the mystery of Christ. Why would he say that? Because, again, there were those Gnostics trying to claim that, that, that this high special knowledge was reserved for them. That Paul doesn't really get it. He's not a true apostle like we are. Okay, Paul says that's not true. You can see, you can, you can perceive that I have this understanding in the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known unto the sons of men, as it hath now been revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Let's look over the book of Peter for a moment. First Peter, interesting statement here. 1 Peter chapter 1. He's talking about this salvation that God would reveal. Look at verse 10 beginning. Concerning which salvation the prophets sought and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you Searching what time or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did point unto, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that should follow them, to whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto you did they minister these things, which now have been announced unto you through them that preached the gospel unto you by the Holy Spirit sent forth from heaven, which things angels desire to look into. Which things angels desire to look into. Do you realize that throughout the Old Testament days, before this was revealed, that even angels were desiring to look into this mystery and understand it? Okay. Uh, mystery does not mean something difficult to understand. That's the way we use the word commonly, but in the scriptures it's usually referring to something unrevealed as yet. And that's the way Paul is using that here. And which in other generations was not made known. Um, I want to tie in verse 10 here, if you would. Drop down, let me see if I can scroll down to verse 10. Yeah, look at verse eight beginning. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, was this grace given, to preach unto the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Incidentally, notice the word unsearchable. What does that suggest to you? Yeah, something that couldn't have been figured out on their own. Have you ever been given an enigma or a problem that is so complex you, you couldn't figure it out without help? Some kind of inside help. That's a description of the mystery that angels desired to look into. This, the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to make all men see what is the dispensation of the mystery which for ages hath been hid in God who created all things? Now look at verse 10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places might be made known through the church the manifold wisdom of God. 
who is referred to by these words, the principalities, the powers in the heavenly places, who's he talking about? Angels, yes, these spiritual beings, not earthly beings, but heavenly beings in the spiritual world. These angels are desiring to look into this gospel and to understand that and to understand the glory of God and the magnificence of God. They want to see, how, how does this work? Now today, or now in the gospel age, as Paul says, now, they can see it unfolded and demonstrated through what? The church. The church. You see that? Angels are watching and learning about the glory of God. This is what Paul is saying here. And they're, they're doing that through observing the church in action. Here's a quote again from Brother Lipscomb I thought was very good here. He says, whatever their places are, their places are heavenly, and one thing that makes them so is the fact that they are learning through the church which they serve the manifold wisdom of God. What do angels do? What is their purpose? According to the Hebrew writer, chapter 1, last verse. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to do service for the sake of them who shall inherit eternal life? They are serving the church. And Brother Lipscomb says that they are learning through the church, which they serve, the manifold wisdom of God. Um, Brother Shepherd adds this comment, I think is good. He says, the angels are therefore represented to us as not only ministering to the church of Christ, but learning from its existence and fortune more and more of the wisdom of God. Hence, we gain a glimpse of a more than world, worldwide purpose in the supreme manifestation of God's mercy in Christ, fulfilled towards higher orders of God's rational creatures. Notice, rational creatures as opposed to what? Mere animals. Animals. Angels are not animals. They are rational beings, like man, okay? So we gain a glimpse of the more than worldwide purpose in the supreme manifestation of God's mercy in Christ, fulfilled towards higher orders of God's rational creatures, aiding even them in progress towards the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus, which is life eternal. This view of angels as our fellow learners in the school of Christ accords well with the wide sweep of thought characteristic of this epistle, literally gathering up all things in Christ. Okay, so what Brother Lipscomb was putting his finger on there, and I think Brother Shepherd saw this is a good point, is that angels are actively involved and learning even today through the work of the church, through observation of the church. They're learning more about the glory of God. I think that's what Paul is saying. Might be made known through the church the manifold wisdom of God. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access in confidence through our faith in him, wherefore I ask that ye may not faint at my tribulations for you, which are your glory. All right. Paul keeps everything into perspective. This imprisonment that I'm suffering, this, uh, the tribulations that I endure, don't lose heart. Don't be discouraged because I'm going through this. These things are for your benefit, for your glory, ultimately. All right, I skipped a few verses there that we had covered last week. Is there any qu question, further question on any of this down through verse 13? Paula, go ahead. Through Jesus Christ. Right. So we do have the mystery that God uh, gave Daniel uh, interpretation of the king. 
Yes. Okay, good question. Is the word mystery used in different senses in the Bible? And I think the answer is yes. And, but when you look at Paul's use of that concept, it's pretty, I think, pretty consistent. Um, he is talking about how God, Jesus Christ, has singled him out as the arrowhead to bring the saving gospel to the Gentiles. He announced that back on the road to Damascus. Paul considers himself the least of the apostles. He was before a blasphemer, a persecutor of the church, but he did it ignorantly, 1 Timothy chapter 1, and in unbelief. And his, purpose, his whole purpose is to reveal this mystery and bring salvation to the Gentiles. That's, his, that's Paul's use of the word. And when you think of it that way, the word mystery means something that is unrevealed. In a way, I think that's true of the other uses too, but that's Paul's, uh, seems to be the thrust of his usage, I think. Yeah, Scott, go ahead. Yes. When there yes, good point. Paul, Scott says, for those who couldn't hear that, that uh, 2 Peter 1 and verse 3 teaches that these mysteries have been revealed through the knowledge of him that called us by his own glory and virtue. It says that in his divine power he hath granted us these. Hath is a past tense verb there, or uh, the granting that occurred is past tense. He has done this has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So we shouldn't be looking for um, special revelations, um, additional insights into the mystery separate and apart from God's word. Okay, For those who have been taught that the Holy Spirit is somehow working separate and apart from God's word, I strongly urge that you think about these verses because that, that's not a scripture and that can very, get very, very dangerous um, if you think about its consequences. Okay, Don, go ahead. Abraham, for example, God has revealed what was necessary at various points. Amos said God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Yes. Uh, but we notice here uh, that the source of all these things is in the heavenly places. Well, for, for years I thought, now where in the world is that? What are we talking about? But the answer is back in chapter 1, verse 20. He says uh, that uh, seated him at the right hand of of God in the heavenly places. So where Christ is, yeah. that's where the source of all these things uh, is. That's right. Uh, but God has revealed them little by little as it served his purpose. Yes. Now, as far as what we don't know, uh, there are some things we don't know yet. They'll be available to us when we get to the heavenly places if we get to heaven. Right. But all things that pertain to life right. and godliness have been revealed. That is, everything we need to know to live the Christian life and to do it in a godly manner has been revealed. But that's a good point. There are many things that, that we've not yet been told. The secret things belong to God, the prophet said. So, uh, you know, there is coming a time when this will be made clearer, 
but we are given what we need now. Yeah, I think that's a good conclusion to all of that. Now notice here in the few moments that remain in verse 14, how he comes right back to where he started in verse one. That was a long, profitable, run-on sentence. It was a picking up of some important points that coincide with Colossians chapter two, which we've already studied. But now he comes right back to his prayer. Verse 14 says, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory that ye may be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inward man. Now let's stop there for a moment, for a moment and notice the, the essence of his prayer. Paul is praying that they may be, these Ephesian Christians may be what? What is it? Strengthened. Strengthened. And this is a timely prayer for every age. When we pray for one another, we should be praying that we be strengthened in the faith. When we pray for Christians in other places, like in Kentucky where they had all the tornadoes and the damage, yes, they need physical assistance. But ultimately what people need is to be strengthened through the Spirit of God in their inward man. Their faith needs to be strengthened. Because if you lose your faith, Christian, what have you? What have you? I mean, you may have all your material needs met and satisfied, but if the spiritual needs are absent, that really means nothing. So this is his, this is his prayer. Say, no, hope. no hope. There's no hope without this. This is critical. So let's remember to keep our focus, not only for ourselves individually, but to assist our brethren. This is the best thing that we can do for them, is to strengthen their faith. He bows his knees and prays for that uh, to, from, from God the Father. Now notice, somebody says, well, that shows that the Holy Spirit then is somehow indwelling people through separate and apart from the Word. Does it? Does this prove that the Holy Spirit does he say that the Holy Spirit is working in people separate and apart from the Word of God? No. As a matter of fact, look at the next verse here. Look how he ties these things together. I'm praying that you be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inward man. And next verse, 17 says, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Do you know that... that the scriptures teach just as clearly the indwelling of Christ as they do the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Both of them indwell the Christian. And how do they do it? Through what? The answer is there. Through faith. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So here again, he's, he's showing us how the gospel is all sufficient for us in our lives. And he's praying that God will strengthen us with power. Remember, the power of God is, is the what? The gospel, right? Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1, verse 16. So these things all pull together here, that he would grant you, according to his mercy and his glory, this, this power, this strength in your heart, to the end that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be strong to apprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. Now he's going to, in the next verses, which I hope you'll read carefully for next week, he's going to talk about how this process in the first century would unfold, okay? How, how God would do this. Very, very important. Remember the, uh, the time limit there with, with regard to the first century, okay? Thanks for your thinking together with me, your comments, and we'll, we're going to stop there and we'll pick up uh, next week, Lord willing. Nancy.